Hello, everybody. <laughs> so when I went home to uh, southwest Missouri this spring to visit my family, I found my parents out in the garden putting in a huge garden compared to their physical abilities and scrambling to get their beets planted the next day because the moon would soon be new. Now, I know a lot of people would scoff at the idea that the moon can influence the size of an onion a head of lettuce the way it does the ocean cycle. But the age-old practice of planting by the stars persists among people that don't even know that biodynamic farming is cool. It reminded me of a day back in the mid-80s when I was taking my grandparents to the doctor. We were passing the Battlefield Mall here in the sprawling south side of Springfield, Missouri. And my grandpa looked over and he said, that's built right on top of the best farmland around here. I knew from my college business classes and bulldozers ripping up land all around that many would scoff at Grandpa's notion that we could be growing food where mall owners were making money on retail. But I remember the lightning bolt that struck me when he said that. My grandparents, Joe and Hazel Cantrell, fed 12 children and neighbors on land that was quite a bit rockier than that under the battlefield mall. He knew what he was talking about. This is a story of folk and conventional wisdom. We see in the My Community's ongoing planting by the stars and in Grandpa's reaction to concrete on top of excellent soil, how folk and conventional wisdom can diverge radically. Today I'm going to talk about how folk and conventional wisdom also align at times and point us in a new direction. That alignment is happening today as our folk wisdom is reasserting the value of good land and good food for a good life. Our folk understanding of what the Italians call la dolce vita is pointing us in the direction of a form of on-the-ground development of our cities and towns that has been with us forever, but which we're making new again today. So first, we want to look at how folk and conventional wisdom diverge. And then we want to look at how our folk wisdom is always with us, building alternatives. And then we'll look at how those alternatives are lining up and pointing us in a new direction. So first, how folk and conventional wisdom diverge. I checked it out, and my grandpa was correct. The soil under the Battlefield Mall is high class, top rated, the absolute best soil for miles around. Scientists map this stuff out. And here we see locations for Newtonia soil in Missouri. And that's what's under the Battlefield Mall here in Springfield, Missouri. And Springfield's also located on what geologists call the Springfield Plateau. Settlers flocked to this area because it had open rolling topography compared to very steep, wooded, rocky hillsides directly east and south in the Ozark Mountains. And then it also had lots of rain and springs, and it was much better for farming than the drier prairie lands that start directly west in Oklahoma and Kansas. Now, it's natural that city, Missouri's third largest city would grow where food grows well. A third of America's agricultural output comes from cropland around cities because our farms and cities grew largely together with local and regional food markets and then exports of surpluses on top of that. But that still doesn't explain why we couldn't design Springfield's growth around that precious Newtonia soil. Why, in fact, an estimated 36% of the land lost to urbanization in recent generations was on farmland, class one and two soils. The reason is, in our conventional wisdom, enshrined in our law, in fact, what we call the highest and best use of land is that which makes the investor the most money. And by the 1980s, that certainly wasn't farming. After World War II, with the growth of agrochemicals, when industry went from producing uh, high-powered explosives to high-powered herbicides. We went from a food to uh, farm to food ratio of one farm producing enough for 19 people to today one farm producing enough for 155 people. Fewer farmers, global markets, those local and regional markets around which our cities grew were long gone. It was much easier and better to sell your land for shopping malls than it was to farm it. But that's progress, and in our conventional wisdom, our driving economic force has long been the exploitation of abundant resources. Even if uh, plowing up the prairie for the cash crop of wheat brings us the great American Dust Bowl, that's more people working in factories and buying stuff like ready-to-eat meal technology after World War II that became must-have TV dinners. 
And that ushered in our processed food era, which was part of uh, bringing us our twin plagues today of childhood obesity and type 2 diabetes. But all along, our conventional control system has been with us building alternatives. Our concern about the industrial uh, agriculture uh, spurred in the 1980s the sustainable agriculture movement. Farmers and consumers promoting healthier farming and healthier eating. And then also in the 1990s, we have what we call the smart growth movement as a reaction to those sprawling towns across farmland. They promoted urban uh, downtown revitalization and farmland preservation. And that came from our deep knowing that it doesn't make social, economic, or environmental sense to abandon cities and pave farmland. Urban disinvestment fueled by racism burned out cities across the country. That's uh, smart growth. And rural disinvestment has left our countryside uh, poor and hungry. Those rural and urban people now live in what we're calling food deserts. And the new community garden and urban agriculture movement is coming about as a response to that. Now let's look at these movements on the ground. Uh, and how they're aligning. We can see how they're aligned when we do that. Out here we have the sustainable agriculture movement by 1990 accomplishing the Organic Production Act, which carved out important market share and standards for those farmers. And then closer in we have the smart growth movement and farmers markets, for example, growing and connecting eaters and growers and communities. And now in the center we have our strong urban agriculture movement. A common thread uniting these movements is the deep knowing, as my grandpa expressed, that the cause of waste is alienation from the land. Wendell Berry wrote that in his book, The Gift of Good Land, and he quoted his colleague, Wes Jackson, who said, where there is alienation, there can be no stewardship. But our folk wisdom is calling our attention to the waste of people, resources, and time. And it is our uh, alternatives that we're developing from that are aligning and pointing us in a new direction of prosperity through stewardship. And this is nothing new. It happens throughout history because we're renewing our relationship and understanding of that. I have here a picture of Pienza, Italy. And this is uh, a place where our folk and conventional wisdom came together in the Renaissance time. And what our catalyst is, is sick land and sick people. Their catalyst was the growth of cities as prosperous centers with mercantile, biz mercantile business and medieval lords moving from their castles into those cities. The concept of neighbors, public roads and bridges built with tax revenue for the common good challenged conventional medieval wisdom. So did the idea of free-flowing commerce from people, uh, free people in the region challenge that wisdom. Pianza is actually a symbol of the new civic thinking that shows up in art throughout that time, educating medieval minds about a new age, about how free-flowing abundance of food and agriculture from outlying uh, fields and orchards to gardens closer in and food in the city is a base of peace, peace and prosperity. I believe we're going through our own renaissance today as our rising consciousness about food and agriculture is taking shape on the land in our new rural and urban uh, pattern that I think will, in the future, make designing our growth around prime ones, class one soils possible. The smart movement laid it out like this, and they got busy on things that reconnect people and uh, community, like bike lanes, front porches, farmers markets. And today, our food and agriculture consciousness is making it happen. Top-selling real estate today is in places where you can bike, walk, or public transit for food. Regional planners, local governments, are looking at food and agriculture needs and opportunities and building in that into their regional planning. We have organizations like Philadelphia's Common Market that are be building hubs for local farms' products. They're reconnecting those rural and urban people that have a common food and poverty problem. And children are learning where food comes from and how great the good stuff is. And we're greening our cities with local and regional food. Here we see the roof of the plant, a vertical urban farm and food business incubator in Chicago. 
and next door is a local food distributor, a regional distributor with local farm suppliers growing on its list. And then we also have, in rural areas, uh, places like here in far north Marquette, Michigan, the community designing its economic development around the, multi the uh, more small farms growing prosperous because they're building also food hubs in that area. Now we've seen how folk and conventional wisdom can diverge radically. We've also seen how our folk wisdom is always with us building alternatives. And we've seen how those alternatives align and are pointing us in a new direction, a form of on-the-ground development that has been with us forever and which we're making new again today. My grandpa taught me this when he cried out at the, the tragedy of cars and concrete on top of good land. Many may still scoff at the idea that we could design our growth around class one soils, or, but many are also wondering what we're going to do with all the shopping malls now that have grass growing up through the concrete. I'll leave you and them with this, uh, these words of the mayor of Pienza when I was there on a study tour. He said, we must be so good in what we are doing, in what we are building, that never will we regret that once there was a field of wheat on that place. Thank you very much.